Good morning. Uh, I hope all of us will take advantage of this financial crisis as an opportunity to take out our meat axe and go whack at those issues that we've been talking about for our entire careers but weren't always listened to. Um, we all know that capitalism and communism and socialism are early industrial age economic theories. And shame on us that we haven't come up with a new one after all these years. So a lot of us have thought about new ideas, but maybe there's an opportunity for us to bring up the conversation. It's not just a question of a bunch of bailouts, it's an opportunity to rethink the whole game. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. That's my short answer to your complex question, what we ought to do. Is this a time to roll up our sleeves and do it seriously? Because I think we've got people's attention now more than we would normally have in the past. Um, it's interesting. I thought it was 20 minutes, so now 30 minutes. I can change it because I just knocked out this morning a whole bunch of the talk. Now I got to. It is 20. I shouldn't have said anything. Damn. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, so as a result, it's hard to condense the whole world into 20 minutes. So I figure I get to the conclusions first, and then I'll go to the evidence later. Uh, the first is that it looks like, uh, by any way you analyze it. If you go around the world and you have various ways of analyzing what is stable and what is not stable, over half the world is potentially unstable. It doesn't mean that half the world is going to go up in flames. It just means that over half the world you can point to, yes, it could go up in flames. It doesn't mean it will, but it means it could. And the likelihood that it won't anywhere in the world is about a pretty low chance. So we have to start to think seriously about the concepts we've all been talking about years, about resilience. How do we apply chaos theory, self-organization, and all that sort of stuff to management crisis situations? Uh, those crises haven't you know, jumped around the planet yet, but it's reasonable to say that it's possible. Now, one of the problems that you mentioned before about a lot of us didn't get the financial crisis. Over the last year and a half, all my investments have been in gold. So it was conservative investments, and unfortunately the gold price fluctuated a little bit too, but at least I've maintained more value. So I didn't write about the financial prices, but my investments went that way. But what I'm saying is that we know that it's plausible to have a lot of chaotic situations occur that are complex and interdependent, which means that the players to resolve and, and address those issues are different. So if you have a military crisis or war, you have a chain of command. And everybody understands that. They go to every military school or whatever it is in the world, they all understand this chain of command. But in a complex emergency, and the tsunami wasn't that complex, but the tsunami was an example where you had Red Cross, you had militaries, you had local authorities, you had NGOs, you had UN systems. But where was the coherence of response? We sort of worked it out. But we ought to seriously take uh, the idea uh, that we're going to be called upon to apply some of the stuff we've all been talking about, chaos theory, self-organization, all that sort of stuff, uh, in a very serious way that has not been before. So um, that's the second one I would, I would ask us to, to think about, is, is taking resilience seriously because it is plausible to have a variety of complex uh, human disasters coming up. Doesn't mean they'll be there. So in the meantime, what I'd like us to push on is a couple of conclusions. One is I think we've got to move from freshwater agriculture as much as possible to saltwater agriculture. I know that doesn't sound like a very important idea, but think about that the water tables are falling around the world. Um, you all know the situation in China with the water is a disaster. India as well, that's 40% of humanity. That's an awful lot of destabilization. And if you can have a, a loan crisis in the United States ripple across the financial, imagine having a refugee situation going with it. So we've got to figure out how to change the water situation in agriculture. Agriculture takes most of the water. So we've got to shift as much to salt water. There's about 100,000 plants that can grow in salt water. Over 100 are in commercial trials right now. We've got coastlines of the world that are just barren. A lot of them are just not even vegetation at all. Those things, you can cut channels in, irrigate with salt water, and produce uh, greenhouse absorbing nice photosynthesis, as well as food for humans, animals, biofuels. Biofuel doesn't care whether it comes from salt water or fresh water. Doesn't give a damn. So we're wasting all this fresh water stuff over here. We've got to shift as much as possible wherever we can. And algae, by the way, is, produces more biofuel per hectare than anything else. And it's not even a close second. Uh, so we're not applying our knowledge in this area. Next is we've got to move, uh, this is more commonly understood, we've got to move from the combustion engine to electric. One of the big issues, uh, I drove the electric car about uh, 
12, 13 years ago. General Motors, the first uh, car, had it. It was one of the testers. It's a fabulous car. Everything's great. I would have bought it. The problem was the batteries cost $10,000 a piece, and there's three of them in the car. Too expensive. China now has come through with a low-cost battery. For those who are in the Olympics, those buses that went around, those were electric car batteries out of a company called Thunder Sky. There's three other companies in there now. So the price of electric batteries has now come down far enough that, in my judgment, we should be converting as fast as possible. There's no reason to do this anymore. Uh, growing animals uh, without um, meat, a lot of my colleagues laughed at me in 1999 when I proposed this in Mozambique. I am now very pleased to say that the first international conference on growing meat without growing animals uh, was held last April this year. So you do a Google search on this, April uh, in vitro meat. I don't want to call it in vitro meat, I don't, it's bad PR. <laughs> We're going to call it something else, so the PR people will take care of this. But think about how much, and I taught you talk already about the water, the majority of water for agriculture. The majority of that water is for animal production. The majority of that land and grain is for animal production. It's an extraordinary drain on the planet. And it's ridiculous. You, we're not eating the hoofs. We're not eating the eyeballs. Some places in China we don't know. But we don't need the whole animal. And it takes years to develop this whole animal. It's terribly wasteful. Any businessman knows you cut out the middleman to make the profit. Same deal. You can also decentralize it. So it's made locally around the world. So as a result, those colleagues from uh, Korea, or those who read the newspapers, know that last year Korea was in the streets protesting American meat. We have skipped the whole issue of Korea's making its own meat. Um, we've also got to go from this day-night condition, because we've got all this electric production around the world, and at nighttime it's unused. So we go through all these mechanisms to figure out what to do about it, which ultimately is very inefficient. So what happens if you had peak load electric production available to every peak need of electric consumption on the world on a real-time, moment-by-moment basis. You can't do it with our current system. But you can in a global satellite system. Remember the old concept of packet switching? <laughs> packet switching, you break your message into pieces, it went all over the world through the satellite system, and most efficiently reassembled on your computer. There's no reason we can't do that with electricity. You can have local production on the Earth, microwave to satellites, and redirect it to receivers to other locations. And then as you need more electricity, then you can build a solar satellites in orbit. So we create our global system as a global system in orbit. So your grid becomes the orbit. Uh, I am very pleased to say that Japan has been the first country to say we're going to do it. Japan is sitting there on fault lines. Nuclear power is a danger <laughs> in fault lines makes you a little nervous. So we got it, so the Japan's come to the conclusion, we're going into space. Um, we got to also move from our local selfish interest to planetary consciousness with global ethics and decision making. And this is something I think that the futurists can really strike home on. We're, we as a group are not just Hungarians or Venezuelans. We're global oriented futurists. You can't look at the future of X without looking at the larger context. That's one of the differences between us and planners. So we've been involved in this conversation from the beginning, and I would hit home with this. You can't just have local selfish interest. It's baloney. Uh, and this is a time when we can get that message out very strongly. So humanity is growing up, for better or for worse. Uh, we are a global species, and we ought to start to act like a global species. Um, we know these challenges facing us are transnational in nature, transinstitutional in solution, so why not global strategies? There is no global strategy infrastructure. You can't call the UN, as it is right now, an infrastructure for global strategic development. At least, it's not very efficient at doing it. We've known about the water crisis for 30, 40 years. Thomas Edison wrote about the energy crisis, Edison, a long time ago. We have known these things a long time ago. We haven't had really efficient, in the sense of business efficiency, effort in, result out.